the the person formulating the question came across a sermon and in this sermon so it's a sermon that is out there on the internet right now and it's actually been recommended by some folks and in the in the sermon the person preaching says that in his last sermon he dealt with the difference between a convert and a disciple so there's a sermon out there being preached by a guy who believes that there is a difference between a convert and a disciple both converts and disciples Everybody included in that, everybody who has given their life to Jesus, everybody who has been saved, everybody who has been forgiven of their sins will one day reside in a place called heaven. But though there are many converts, there are few disciples. There are few who truly walk with the Lord on a day-by-day basis. And, you know, I've been saved now almost for three decades. Just prior to my being saved, of course, John MacArthur wrote his book on the gospel according to Jesus. We're seeing a a resurgence of this thing. I don't think it ever goes away. I think MacArthur just happened to be preaching through Matthew, he saw so convincingly of the truth of what Scripture teaches that he wrote a book about it. And it just, in a recurring fashion, became an issue. But I suspect that this this is a common error that has been set forth ever since the beginning. And the reason I think it is this that even back in Paul's day, you had people with a form of godliness who denied the power thereof. What does that mean? The form of godliness is they claim to be a convert, but their life does not reveal a daily walking with the Lord or daily discipleship. They're denying the power of the Lord. They're denying that radical transformation on that level that God brings into a person that he saves. This has been, and oh, by the way, 2,000 years ago, we were told to avoid people like this. People who set forth this teaching, it is extremely damning. Because what you are doing is you're basically telling people You can be saved. You can be like a first level Christian. You can be a convert where you're going to go to heaven, but you don't necessarily have to be a disciple. And and maybe it has to do with rewards in the end, but you'll be good. You'll be good. And so I think think for the second question, we just want to talk about this. Is the concept of discipleship equal to Christianity? Or is it some kind of higher level or more greatly committed Christian? That's the question that we want to throw on the table. Now, as I got to thinking about the term disciple, I thought, Of course, it's used different ways in the New Testament. For instance, open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 10. Sometimes disciple simply refers to one of the 12 apostles. There's there's repeated times when Scripture would say, the disciples, and it specifically meant the twelve, 
or the eleven? Somebody read Matthew 10.1. And he called to him his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits. Yeah, his 12 disciples. Well, are there only 12 disciples? Well, in one sense, the inner circle, they were called the disciples. And so that's a, that's a term that designates that, that inner group. But here's another reality. The word, the word basically means a learner, a follower. To be a disciple of Christ is to be a learner of Christ. It's to be a follower of Christ. But the reality is, it can be used not only more broadly than the twelve, it can be used so broadly that it includes people that are not even genuine. And go to John 6 for the really classic text on that. John 6, 66. You know, Jesus was saying the hard things in John 6. He was talking about eating his flesh, drinking his blood, and the people were saying, these are hard sayings. Who can, who can hear these things? And what does John 6, 66 say? Anybody? From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. See, it calls them disciples, and yet it immediately says they're not even genuine. They didn't walk with him anymore. But... Disciple can also be used in a more limited sense than that, but in a much broader sense than just the twelve. I'll give you an example there. The classic example that comes to my mind there is the text in John 8. Now turn to John 8, verse 31. Somebody read that when you get it. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. Okay, now their disciple is broader than the twelve. But what he's saying to them is, read that again, brother. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciple. Catch the word truly. Truly. In John 6.66, 6, some who had walked with him for a season departed. Here he's saying, look, I'll tell you what it will identify you if you're a true disciple. So, the reality is, there were disciples that weren't true. There's a description of what it means to be true. It's obviously broader than just the 12. So it's used differently. But I would say that the way that I want to use it going forth, as I use it from now on, it's, it's that way, right there, from John 8. Truly, who is a true disciple? Does that equal true Christianity? Or does it not? That's the question that's on the table. That's what I'm talking about. Obviously, there are disciples who fall away and aren't genuine. Obviously, sometimes the twelve are called disciples. But I'm talking about those in, in the broadest sense who are true disciples. So, that's what we're talking about. Um, this, why is this such an issue? It's such an issue because when you open up your Bibles, there are some really strong things that are said about being a disciple. And if you can just convince yourself that disciple is like a, a certain class of Christian, a certain designation of committed people, then what you can do is tone down what it means to be a Christian. But if disciple equals Christian, then there's not a whole lot of them. And the people that espouse this view want to think that there's a whole lot of more Christians out there than 
than what there would be if Christian equals disciple. And again, one of the classic texts on this is Luke 14. I mean, if you look at Luke 14, you've got some of the strongest statements stated in Scripture about what it means to be a disciple. Look at Luke 14, and somebody can just read, start reading in verse 26 and read all the way down to verse 33. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it? Lest after he had laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king goes to make war against another king, does not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? Or else while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks conditions of peace. So likewise, Whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. You see how demanding that definition is? You need to hate father and mother or you can't be his disciple. You need to carry the cross. You need to die. You need to forsake all. Salvation, I mean... What people don't like is, on the one hand, people, people recognize right away, if that is what it means to be a Christian, there are not many. It's like it says here, there are few who truly walk with the Lord on a day-by-day -day basis. Though there are many converts, there are few disciples. There are few who truly walk with the Lord on a day-by-day -day basis. You see, these preachers who preach this stuff, they, they recognize that. They look around and they recognize, wow, if that is a definition of basic Christianity, there's not many Christians. Now, Jesus actually said that, that there's not many. So, so from here to the end of this Bible study, let's prove in any way we possibly can that disciple equals Christian or that it doesn't equal Christian? Is it possible to believe, not be committed, not be surrendered to Christ, not walk with Him day by day, but because we believed we're still converted, even though Jesus says, if you don't forsake all that you have, you can't be my disciple. But that's just an ultra-committed, extra-committed, walking-committed, day-by-day Christian. And maybe they're going to have greater rewards, but all it takes is believing to get in. Or is this adding works to the gospel? That's the charge, typically. But, by the way, just remember, these words are stated by Jesus. So whatever they mean... Whatever disciple means, you can't be one unless you forsake all that you have. So, here's the thing. <clears throat> Forsaking all that you have really comes around to dealing with Christ as Lord. That's essential that we think about Christ as Lord. Scripture says He is Lord of Lords. <clears throat> Is it essential to be saved to submit to Christ as Lord? Yeah. Can you prove that? Luke 19.27 So let's look at Luke 19.27 That's just one verse I thought of that's pretty striking. Yeah, let's look at... Let's, we're we're going to make a case here, so we'll follow any number of rabbit trails to build our case. 
We'll bring all the evidence and put it out on top of the table. Go ahead and read it when you, when you have it. Um, but at, in this, the parable of the ten minus, but as for these enemies of mine, and he describes them, who did not want me to reign over them, and then it talks about what happens to them, bring them here and slaughter them before me. They wouldn't submit to him. They wouldn't have him reign over them. And in the end, when he comes in judgment, he slaughters them. That's kind of convincing. Mm -hmm. let's, let's do something in the beginning here. Let's simply look at the book of Acts. And I've got some selected texts here where the term disciple is used in the book of Acts. What's, what's nice about the book of Acts is that very often the term disciple is used. As, as they traveled around to the different churches, they called the people disciples. What were they saying? Were they basically saying, oh, in every church there's this select little group of really committed people. If that's the case, what were the other people called? They're never called. There isn't another word used. There, it isn't like, okay, in every church you've got this group, ultra committed, this group, which are just simply converts. You don't see any designation made like that. Well, let's just look at a few of these. Acts chapter 6. Let's start there. Verse 7. Somebody read that when you get there. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests came, became obedient to the faith. Okay. When I read that, what I find is, for one, faith isn't even separated from obedience. It's the obedience of faith. But these guys are coming to the faith and they're being called disciples. The disciples were increasing and even some of them were these priests who were becoming obedient to the faith. They're being called disciples. Let's, let's, I, I mean, it kind of, it's going to take a number of these for you just to get a feel for how the New Testament regarded these people. Let's look at chapter 9, verse 1. And what I'm asking you as you hear these, does it sound like Scripture, like God is identifying a special elite group of Christians who are obeying Christ, whereas there's a majority of Christians who don't obey Christ and aren't disciples? Does it sound like that difference is being designated here? Now listen to this. Somebody read 9 1. But Saul, still breathing uh, threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Okay, right there, he equates being a disciple to belonging to the way. Now, can you imagine this? <clears throat> can you imagine Paul coming in here, busting in? Are you a believer? Yeah, I'm a believer. Well, I'm going to drag you off to prison if you're a disciple. Are you a disciple? No, I'm just a believer. So your trust is in Christ? Yes, my trust is in Christ. You believe on this guy that I hate? Yes. Okay, you can leave. You're okay because you're not committed to him. But that doesn't sound like that's what that text... That text, if you're a disciple, you belong to the way. You belong to the way, you're a Christian. That's what the early Christians were called. They were called the way. Or go to 926. In 
when he uh, and when he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples, and they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord, who spoke to him, and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. Right, even there, when it talks about the disciples being afraid, does that mean that if you're a convert but you're not a disciple, you weren't afraid? I mean, is this, it, does it sound like they're making a designation between disciple and just being a Christian? Is it like, well, those disciples, it's those guys that were really committed. They were the ones that were afraid of Paul. If you were just a believer, you weren't afraid of him. Well, I mean, that's crazy talk. That's not how the word's being used. If you just listen for the sense of it, or let's go to this, verse, uh, chapter 11, verse 26. Somebody read that. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year they met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. Well, that one's pretty obvious. Mm. The disciples are called Christians. Not just the elite group. Disciple and equipment and Christian equals each other. That's, they were called Christians. We don't call, even, even these non-lordship guys that are espousing this position, if you're simply a convert, they would call you a Christian. Well, wait, you can't call them Christians because only disciples are called Christians. It's, that's crazy. They, obviously, it's equated there in Scripture. Or, let's go to chapter 14, verse 22. Strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith. Look, at, listen to that. Who are the disciples? You see, what, they, what these guys want to say is a convert is somebody who simply believes... A disciple is somebody who's really obeying Christ and committed to following Him. But what's true of the disciples? The disciples are being encouraged to continue in the faith. Wait, wouldn't, wouldn't that apply to the, the non-disciple Christians? It's, it's, there's no two groups there. They're all the same. They're one and the same. Disciples are the people in the church. How about another one? 1823. After spending some time there, he departed and went from one place to the next through the region of Galatia and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. Again, I mean, it's, that's who they are. There's never any double designation. That's who the Christians are. Or, or go just a little further to 1827. And when he wished to cross to Achaia, the brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. Yeah, so what it, I mean, again, it's just crazy to say, well, the guys that are only converts, don't you welcome him. Just you who are committed followers of Christ, you welcome him. Well, that's craziness. That's not, it, it means everybody in the church over there. There's no double, you can scour the book of Acts and there is simply no double designation for Christians. They're all called disciples. Disciples are called Christians. It's, it's a... It's a term that is universally used to describe a Christian. This idea, now listen, 
One of the things that we need to remember is that essential to the gospel is believing on Jesus as Lord. Can you think of any text that just the basic faith of the gospel has to do with Jesus Christ as Lord? Can you think of anything? Remember, here's a man. What must I do to be saved? Remember what he said? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. We can just tag that in there and read across it. But wait a second. When you're told to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, does that mean you can embrace Him as not being Lord? Does that mean, well, I can believe in Him, but, but believing in Him as Lord doesn't mean that I have to obey Him. What's, the, what's one of the plainest texts that says that can't be so? It's Jesus' own words in Luke 6. Luke 6.46 maybe? Somebody look at that text. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? You see what he's saying? What are you doing? You call me Lord Jesus Christ and you don't do what I say? Why? I mean, what you're doing is you're showing your hypocrisy. You look at Him, you call Him Lord, and you don't submit to Him. That's hypocrisy. Why would you do that? Listen, Jesus said this. Make no mistake about it. He said, it is not everybody that calls me Lord, Lord, who inherits the kingdom. This is Matthew 7.21. He says, those who inherit the kingdom, they not only call me Lord, they acknowledge me as Lord by their life. They do the will of my Father. And I'll tell you this, he never requires us to do anything that isn't the will of His Father and His Lordship. What, what does it say there in Romans chapter 10 about being saved? Anybody think? Like 10, 9 and following? Somebody look at that and read that. All who call, the name of the Lord. All who call upon the name of the Lord. Calling upon the name of the Lord. You see... When, when the actual cry and call and faith of the gospel is put in terms of Jesus being Lord, what's he saying? You, you can't just call me Lord. You can't believe on me as Lord. You can't cry out to me as Lord and not submit to me. It's not everybody who says, Lord, Lord, that inherits the kingdom. It's those who do the will of my Father. And he goes on to tell that parable. There's a wise man, there's a foolish man. The wise man builds his house on the rock. The wise man hears my words and does them. The foolish man, he hears my words and he doesn't do them. And John is very emphatic about this. He says that if we say we know him, we're not keeping his commandments. We're liars and the truth isn't in us. Scripture could not be more plain at this point. And I'll tell you this, when you look at that text in Matthew 7.23, do you know what he says to the people? He says, depart from me. Wait a second, we were religious. We, no, we're not in the group. We're not in that group that's getting... We were converts. We believed. We called you Lord. We went to church. We did the mighty works. We prophesied in your name. We cast out demons. But you know what he says to them? He says, depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. What does that mean? That means they never regarded Him as Lord at all. Remember, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things I say? What characterized their life? Lawlessness. They didn't do what He said. Listen, this idea that discipleship is some, it's some exclusive class that will get you greater reward, don't buy that. What Jesus is saying is if you don't hate your father and mother, 
your children, your closest relationships, your own life, if you're not willing to forsake all that you have, you cannot be my disciple. You have to recognize when Jesus saves us, He saves us from self-rule. That is what it is to be saved. It's to come under His authority. What did He say? I'll tell you what He said. He didn't say that there's a special class. Uh uh. He said to all men, Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. He said, I'll give you rest. You know what he said? Take my yoke. You think that means that there's no surrender to his being Lord? God made him Lord. We don't make Him Lord. It's not one of our works. It's not a work by which we get saved. He is Lord. And He comes. And He offers us rest, peace, forgiveness, salvation. But He extends that yoke to us. We must bow. Listen, that's not works to surrender to Him to lay down the weapons of our warfare and to bow. That's, that's coming on His... T- it's surrender. It's coming on His terms. You see, if I believe on the name of Jesus Christ and He is Lord, You're not a true believer. You're deceiving yourself if I say, I believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, but then you don't submit to Him as Lord. Because what you're really saying is, I don't believe He's Lord. Or if He is, He has no sway over me. A similar verse in uh, John 14, Jesus says, If you love me, keep my commandments. And I connected that to almost the last verse in 1 Corinthians where it says, If anyone does not love the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be accursed. Right. If you love him, keep his commandments. If you don't keep his commandments, you indicate you don't love him. They go hand in hand. What else? Acts 2.36. I mean, that's a classic text on this subject. Somebody look that one up. Somebody read that. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. See, God has made him Lord. God has given him reign over all. He is Lord. He's Lord of Lords. You know, a text that I think is as helpful as any is consider the Great Commission. Turn to your t- turn in your Bibles to Matthew 28:18. Somebody read that. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Okay, yeah, I mean, just let's stop right there. What's he telling us to do? Go to all the nations and create? Don't create converts. We're not interested in people being saved just from hell. You go out and make the extra special class. Is that what he's saying? And and then he attaches baptizing to disciple. Wait, isn't that telling? Whoever these disciples are, they're the ones getting baptized. Would Would he say, just go out to the exclusive class? Would He not call us to go? If there was truly two different classes, would He not call us to go make converts and disciples and baptize both bunches? Would He be just exclusive that 
You know, don't concern yourself with the vast majority of people that are going to be saved. Go and make this exclusive little group and don't worry about the converts. Don't worry about baptizing them, teaching them. That, that would be ludicrous. But obviously, disciple here means that's what it is to make a Christian, to make disciples. And those, who, those are the people that you baptize. I've heard some preachers use Matthew 24, 24 as describing uh, elect and then very elect. And then they said, for false Christ or prophets will arise and perform many signs and wonders so as to lead astray, if possible. And the King James says, even the very elect. Mm. But it means, <laughs> it means <laughs> some of them take it and they go, see, there's a special group of Christians, but it's meaning the, the very, the very... When you have texts that say, if you say that you know Christ and you don't keep His commandments, you're a liar and the truth isn't in you. If you say, well, all that means is I'm not a disciple. Okay, you bank your soul on that. I wouldn't. That's plain enough language to me to recognize you're playing with people's souls everlastingly if you start setting forth that kind of teaching. And, and what are you going to do with, with Matthew 7.21? If you don't do the will of the Father, you will not inherit the kingdom. Period. I mean, scripture, is, scripture is plain enough. And the term disciple, is, it's a great term. That's why it's used so much. It means to be a follower, to truly be a disciple. Jesus said, my word, if my word abides in you, you're, tr you're true, you're genuine. If it finds place in your heart, what I speak. He said, my sheep, they hear my voice. To hear his voice doesn't mean that you just hear a sound and, and it resonates on your eardrum to hear. See, Scripture talks about hearing and not hearing. When he talks about my sheep hear my voice, he's saying they hear it and they do it. If you hear and don't do it, you're not hearing. His sheep, not a special class. There's not sheep and those that are kind of sheep or offhandedly sheep or goats who get in or none of that. You're either sheep or you're a goat. Period. And his sheep hear his voice. They know his voice. They hear his voice. Any other arguments you guys put on the table here? I have a question, brother. I know people who believe this way uh, that they're um, there are levels of Christians and one of the arguments that I heard someone say one time was I, I know I'm not doing as well as I could be doing I'm going to be one of those Christians who are um, saved but as through fire like I'm going into heaven smoking because I was so much like the world but there was a verse that he called upon, saved us through fire, something like that, that he used to defend his way of thinking. Isn't that 1 Corinthians? It's 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And it's a true verse. It's talking about men and the building materials that they've used. And I think, I think what we're getting at there is that this isn't to say that you had people that were as worldly as possible and disobedient and not surrendered to Christ. I think what you have is people who are genuinely saved, but they're coming to have their ministry examined. And the truth is, they built with enough human materials that they're going to suffer loss. I think the truth that we've got there is that even among Christians, you have people who aren't as careful as they ought to be. 
and there's going to be, I mean, the, the fires of judgment are going to test what our lives were made of, what our ministries were made of. And there are things that we may think are, are good and they're precious stone and they're, they're silver and gold, but we're going to find their wood, hay, and stubble, and they're not going to abide that day. So I, I think that's the truth that's being taught there. Uh, go to everybody. Go to John fifteen, and just start. Every, somebody find that passage and just start reading in verse one, and maybe we'll go to like I don't know verse eight or something. But just just start reading and listen. Listen to this. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Okay. So if you're in him, you're fruit bearing. Now keep going. And every branch that does not that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean, because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. Okay, now that isn't good. If you're not abiding in Christ, you get burned. And I don't think, I, I don't think, I, I think, I think this is hell burned. Now keep going. If anyone does not, uh, verse 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. And see, there's our word again. Prove to be disciples. How do you prove to be a disciple? What's the opposite in that pass, those passages of not being a disciple? Not being a, it's not just being a lower class. It's being burned. You're either burned or you're fruitful and proved to be His disciple. Disciple is obviously that which is authentic. Whereas... Anyways, I just think that's another passage that proves the point. I think if you go and you read 1 Corinthians chapter 3, what you have to come to grips with is you're actually dealing with men's ministries. He's talking about his ministry, Apollos' ministry, and the materials that they build on, and the fact that on Judgment Day that's going to be tested, and the building materials that, that a man's ministry... I'm not even sure that it's it's necessarily applicable. Maybe there's some principles you could draw and apply to everybody's lives, but the primary purpose has to do with men's ministries. So I wouldn't I, I wouldn't press it really strongly beyond that. But you prove to be a disciple by being fruitful, and if you're not fruitful, you get thrown in the fire. Because if you're not fruitful, you indicate that you're not abiding in Christ. If you're abiding in Christ, you will be fruitful and so prove to be His disciple. I do worry sometimes when I think about uh, too much is given, much is expected, and sometimes that, that worries me a little bit. You know? okay. Yeah, the whole... Th I mean, Judgment Day is fearful. Yeah. Being in the ministry... I mean, you know, the fire, when you think about the fire, a man's ministry, I mean, you think about texts like James 3, 1, where somebody that's teaching, they're going to be judged with a stricter judgment to whom much is given. I mean, that, that just has to do with people that have had much given, especially much in the way of spiritual light. It's going to be more tolerable for you than Sodom and Gomorrah to those that had light given. The whole thing is fearful. The thing about your, your works being tested by fire, I mean, the, the idea that, that there's stricter judgment for teachers, the idea that 
it to the more light you've been given, the more it, that's going to be required for you of you on Judgment Day. We are moving towards standing before God all by ourselves. That's why anybody that has the slightest perception of this, you just desperately want an advocate in that day. You desperately want a covering. You, you want a hiding place. If you don't have a hiding place, you're in trouble. Well, anything else on this? Not to belabor it, but something that stuck out to me years ago in Revelation 21, it says... It gives a list of those who will be burned in the lake of fire. And it, call, it says one of them is the detestable. And I ran through my mind other verses that use that same phrase. And one is Titus 1.16, where it says they profess to know God, so they have a verbal profession, but they deny Him by their works. They are detestable. Hmm. And so the detestable are people who say they know God and they deny Him by their works. And he says in Revelation 21, they're going to be thrown in the lake of fire. So that's pretty serious. Right. You can imagine what Christ said on this earth. He'll say on Judgment Day. Somebody will say, but, but the preacher told me. There was such a thing as a convert and somebody could actually be saved and not walk with you daily. Because our Lord on Judgment Day, whatever you may have been exposed to in teaching, you called me Lord and you didn't do what I say. You were, you were hypocrites. You could not... I mean... See, we say from like Isaiah, yeah, here's a man, and he takes a piece of wood, and out of half of it, he makes an idol and he bounds down to it. The other half, he cooks his meal in the fire. And he said, the guy doesn't have enough sense to recognize he's cooking half of, he's cooking his meal with half of it. And then he's bowing down to the other half and saying, you're my God, save me. But you know, we look at that and we say, yeah, boy, that's foolish. But you know what? It's going to be the same thing with regards to this. You, out of your own mouth, you called me Lord and did not bow. You were a liar and the truth wasn't in you. No matter what he preached, because we're all going to be accountable for ourselves. Oh, to be a false teacher. Stricter judgment. False teachers. I, I, sometimes I just get these thoughts and I tremble for some of these guys. The things they say. You called me Lord, Lord. And you didn't... You didn't live like I was Lord. Depart from me. You didn't believe. You, you can't divide Christ. You take Him as He is and His Father has made Him Lord and Christ. He is Lord of all. And when you call upon Him, you must call upon the Lord. And... Tozer said this, The Lord will not save those He cannot command. He will not divide Himself. You cannot believe on a half Christ. That's a good word to end on. Father, we don't want to believe in a half Christ. We want all of them. We want to be saved to the uttermost. We want the Lord Jesus Christ to come to us. Every bit, the fullness of what every one of His names, what every one of His titles encompasses, involves, all the reality, all the truth, all the fullness. We want Christ in all of His glory to come and save us. We, oh, we thank You for such a glorious Savior as we have. We do call You Lord. 
I know we want our lives to reflect that reality in submission, obedience, brokenness, being resigned. Oh, help us. What a, what a sweet thing it is when we are indeed resigned to your will. That is the truest freedom. We want that freedom. You've said your yoke is easy. Your burden is light. And that we would find rest for our souls. Thank you. We thank you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.